fourth edition is better than fifth. I'm not even going to bother explaining why. Let's just get right to it. Forget the intro, Matt. Today, we're not going to do that, no matter what. Fourth edition D&D gets some of the biggest hate of any edition D&D out there. You, you don't believe me? Mention fourth edition in any room and it, watch it turn into that meme from American Chopper. The point is, people have opinions about fourth edition, including us, and it's not hard to see why. Fourth edition was a huge departure for D&D. It came off of the decade plus long high that was third in a 3.5 edition, and fourth edition was a radical departure of design. In a nutshell, 4th edition decided to make it explicitly clear that you were playing a game. And a lot of people didn't like that. Look back at the forums from those days. Or on second thought, don't. No good can come of that. But if you did, uh, you'd see that a big part of the, the outcry against 4th edition was how it felt Disney-fied. Uh, people would say it felt like playing in a theme park version of D&D, or that D&D had become an MMO, and it was World of Warcraft, but on your tabletop. The point is, 4th edition did something different. The rules stepped away from the idea of trying to simulate a world to trying to make a game, uh, which is why they got rid of uh, so many, like, 3rd edition tropes, like, like, diagonal movement is 1.5 squares, and they just turned it into cube world. Everything operates on a grid. Uh, the game required you to have not only a battle grid, but miniatures to, to play on. Uh, third edition kind of also required a grid and miniatures. They just weren't as explicit about it. But fourth edition was. Fourth edition was, was the D&D designers taking the unwritten rules of D&D and writing them down where everyone can see. And a lot of people didn't like that. In 4th edition, level 1 is the least suckiest of all because 4th edition took a radical approach to players. You can see this in how all of the player characters are designed. You're not just fantasy adventurers, you're fantasy heroes. How do they capture the, that feeling? How did 4th edition give everyone something interesting and exciting to do on their turn? They did it with powers. In 4th edition, powers rule everything around you. If you're familiar with 5th edition, powers are like battle master maneuvers, or uh, if we're being really accurate, they're more like wizard spells. Because 4th edition sets out to address the disparity that exists between fighters and wizards that has since, like, the, the first days of the game. One of the big unwritten rules of D&D is that the wizard eventually outstrips the fighter. At some point, the fighter stops being the star of combat and is instead there to soak up damage and maybe do a little bit while the spellcasters do all the real work. The, the trope, linear fighters, quadratic wizards, originates with D&D as a way of reflecting the uneven power curve that these two classes have. Fourth edition fixed that. How? By turning everyone into wizards. Yep, that's right. You are a wizard, and you're a wizard, and you're a wizard, Harry. Everyone got spells effectively, and they let them use them all the time. If you were playing a melee character, your spell might be called Cleave, or Slash and Pummel, or Anvil of Doom, or Vorpal Tornado. Those are all real 4th edition powers that fighters specifically had. In 4th edition, fighters could do area attacks, could hit enemies, could apply conditions with every attack. They could even rush around the battlefield or give themselves regeneration, or jump like super far, even teleport a little bit, or buff their own movement speed. And that's just fighters. Barbarians, rangers, all of these, like, typically martial characters had abilities that, that sounded and worked a little bit more like spells. And there were at-will powers, which are a lot like 5th edition cantrip. And there are encounter powers. As the name suggests, they're powers you can use once per encounter. They're typically a little bit more dramatic because they're a more limited resource. And daily powers, which are supposed to be uh, the, the once per day, this changes the fight. You know, this is your super ultimate attack. From just the name, tell how often you were expected to use the power. And everything being based in powers meant that the designers could get weird with it because they have a tighter control on what a given character can and can't do powers let them flex their their creative muscles and introduce a ton of new character classes fourth edition alone had avengers wardens battle minds invokers shamans sword mages even a vampire that you could play as a class seekers assassins ardents you get the idea but 4th edition came up with some of the most innovative classes that any edition of D&D has had, and it can be summed up, represented by the one class that 
almost everyone's been clamoring for since 4th edition went the way of Google Wave and Vine and all the other technology that died before its time. And that is the Warlord. The Warlord is a D&D &D legend. It was a class that, that healed other people in the party but used no magic. You just picked someone up, gave them a cool, manly, like, warrior arm clasp and said, now get back in there. And they, they'd do it. They'd heal. Or you could give them an extra attack on your turn. Or you could protect your allies. Or you could shift your, your whole party around in combat. Warlords were a, a brand new paradigm for what a character could be like in D&D. The game was full of classes like this, and each one had a different role in the party. And that's another unwritten rule of D&D. &D. You have frontline fighters, squishy spellcasters, and in general, the one protects the others. Of course, it wasn't always the case. Uh, I think as it shook out in 4th edition, the only thing that really mattered, just like in 5th, is how often can you hit and how hard can you hit while doing it? How many attacks are you making, right? Like, that's that's been the secret to D&D &D, no matter the edition. The point is that they tried acknowledging, like, these different play styles and giving people options to, to do. Like, it was fun, and you did more than just heal your party when you were playing a healer. You might heal someone and move them, or, like, heal someone and then give them an extra attack or or something like that. Outside of combat, 4th edition made some big innovations too. And again, it all comes down to the idea that you are playing a game and it should be fun to play it. I'm talking about skill challenges. Skill challenges are something that everyone who ever played 4th edition even once remembers. Uh, these are one of the few times that, that Wizards of the Coast tried to give more than just cursory mechanics to accomplishing things with your skills. Finally, uh, you have a way to do something more than just roll a d20 and see if number high. Skill challenges are pretty simple. Get X number of successes, usually 3 to 12, before you get 3 failures. Every player at the table can participate, and they all have their own skills that they can bring to the table. If you read through some of the better 4th edition adventures, you'll find that the designers gave uh, different skills, different uses for different skills for the skill challenges. So like in a chase, you might use athletics to vault over a toppled fruit cart to catch up to your prey. You might use perception to see where they're going. You might use insight to try and figure out where they're headed next so you can cut them off. Whatever you were trying to do, like you got to use your skill, you got to roll it, and if you succeeded, you contributed to the overall goal. It was a way to get everyone at the table involved instead of the usual chorus of, oh, oh, me, I also have Arcana. I want to make an Arcana check. I want to make an Arcana check. I want to make a search check. I want to make an insight check. But not only that, uh, skill challenges gave pressure and a mechanical benefit for both success and uh, a result for failure. It's honestly one of the best mechanics I think D&D has ever had to the point that people will still run skill challenges in 5th edition. Isn't that right, Matt? It's true. That's just the player side. Let's talk about monsters. Another unwritten rule of D&D &D is that monsters should use a variety of different tactics, and that you should almost never fight just one monster. That's not how the game is meant to be played. Fourth edition makes that explicit too. Uh, just like they did with players, they introduced the idea of monster rolls for every monster in the game. There's artillery, which do damage at range, brutes, which hit hard and have a lot of hit points, controllers, which, just like controller players, uh, do all the status effect and all the AoE damage, lurkers, which, which typically rely on stealth and uh, high damage against a single target, skirmishes, which are very mobile combatants and can be very annoying and hard to hit, and soldiers who have high AC and high defenses. On top of that, though, you have three other categories of monsters, minions, elites, and solos. And that's just the start. Like, that's just the, the general rules. Monsters in 4th edition were great. They were so creative. They had a ton of variety to them. I mean, look at just, like, goblins. There's goblin cutters, goblin snipers, goblin blackblades, goblin cutthroats, goblin warriors, goblin beast riders, sharpshooters, hexers, hex hurlers, skull cleavers, underbosses. All of these different kinds of goblins have like a different role and a different play style in combat. And they tell you through their powers just what you're supposed to do with them. Uh, and even alongside the monster manual like entries, they would tell you what to do. So you'd have like, oh yeah, there's two skull cleavers, there's a hex hurler, there's a couple of fighters 
fire beetles here as well. Like it came with like pre-designed little encounter chunks and you can kind of see exactly how they're meant to, to, to play out. All the monsters are like this, from ogres to bugbears to even dragons. Look at the stat blocks. Take, take a look at the Elder Pyroclastic Dragon. This is a 21st level dragon, and that's not even the highest level you can get. D&D 4th edition goes up to 30th level, and monsters go even higher. But the Pyroclastic Dragon has a ton of abilities that make it uh, difficult for a party to deal with. It's got its claw and bite attacks, sure, but then it's got a breath weapon. It has a reaction that it uses whenever it's hit. It explodes with fiery energy and knocks back whoever hit it. It's got an area attack that knocks enemies prone, and it has an aura that damages and poisons anyone within five squares of it. Compare that to like a red dragon out of 5th edition and you have a much harder, much more challenging enemy that makes the fight feel dynamic. It's constantly dealing damage, it's got big attacks you gotta watch out for, and it can hurt you on your turn. Uh, but, but even look at a normal dragon, right? Like take a black dragon from 4th compared to 5th. 4th edition's got a whole agenda and story in its stat block. It's got a number of traits that give it extra actions. You know, when it can use its tail outside of its turn, it can bite, it can charge, it's got attacks that can hit more than one person. If it's bloodied, which just means it's at or below half hit points, it deals damage to anyone adjacent to it anytime it gets hurt. Uh, that that alone is a decision you have to make. It's got attacks that... that are ranged attacks beyond just its single rechargeable breath weapon that it can use every turn if it wants. It deals ongoing damage, that, that's the gift that keeps on giving. It's got reaction attacks. There's a lot going on here. Compare that to like the fifth edition Black Dragon and there's just no contest. That same kind of monster design you can find throughout fourth edition. Uh, the, the whole idea is that fights are fun and, and should feel challenging and dynamic and you should always be like paying attention to like where are you and, and are you going to attack now? Are you going to risk taking damage? W what are you going to do? Uh, and again, it's all because it wrote down those unwritten rules, including having monsters that act differently uh, when they're below half hit points, right? Like... Hit points are kind of a nebulous thing in any D&D except for fourth, where once you get to half or below, you're bloodied. Uh, and that meant something. Sometimes monsters would get extra attacks or deal extra damage. Other monsters, like gnolls, would get extra attacks against you if you were bloodied. It's extremely gamey, sure, but it's also very fun. It, it makes you consider like where your hit points are. There's a reason to heal before you get down into like zero hit points or or very low that you might be taken out. A bloody is actually one of my favorite mechanics. Like it lets you know like, all right, I'm putting the hurt on this monster. It's time to either break out the big guns and try and finish them off quickly, or I can kind of uh, ease off of the gas a little bit. Like it, it's, it's a good indicator and uh, having different powers, having different abilities. Some monsters had like some kind of transformations that they would would go through it's it's a lot like the the phases of an mmo boss fight world of warcraft especially like you 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 get down like 20 percent 60 percent of their health and they transform right it's the whole uh, it's not even my final form you fools kind of thing uh bloodied was was a great way to bring that into D D. even fifth edition has that the the kind of uh, legacy of that idea with its mythic monsters introduced in Mythic Odysseys of Theros, where if you kill them once, they get all of their health back and they have even more powerful attacks than they did before. They became more powerful than you could possibly imagine because you struck them down. 4th edition did a ton of stuff like that, and it's kind of taken a back burner owing to 5th edition's, like, legacy game status. There's a lot of uh, homages to 2nd edition and 3rd edition here, and if you're looking at things by just purely capitalist standards, 5th edition wins. I mean, it's the most popular, it's it's got the most players, it's sold the most, it's it's made Wizards of the Coast a uh, billion dollars along with Magic the Gathering, most of that's probably Magic the Gathering, but, but are numbers the only thing that matter, comrades? Or uh, are they just telling you the tale that your oppressors want you to know? You can seize the means of your own production and just go play 4th edition if you want. Uh, in fact, uh, doing so will probably change the way that you play 5th edition. Uh, doing so will will change how you think about the game. That's why 4th edition is the best edition of D&D. It, it changes like what you think about. It changes the way that, that you think about fights. It changes the way that you think about what a player character can do, what, what your hero can do. So... Yeah, uh, fourth, better than fifth.
Hey, if you are trying to decide between 4th and 5th and can't make up your mind, why not give up on D&D altogether just for a little bit? Check out our video on how to play Avatar The Last Airbender, the RPG. I guess it's called Avatar Legends, but that doesn't matter. Just click this video. You know what to do. I'm JR. This has been Bell of Lost Souls. We'll catch you next time. Ooh, we're doing a new thing now. I'm spinning around till Matt cuts me out. <laughs>